Okay. Um, so this week's topic, we're already on week three. Can't believe it. Um, we're going to be talking about skill building and um, kind of, you know, the idea behind having the different series is to build and um, challenge you and learn new things. So today's topic is actually about applied behavior analysis. And then specifically within ABA, we're going to learn about doing task analysis. Um, so before we even go any further, I'm just curious off the bat, has anybody in here um, ever done any kind of ABA, applied behavior analysis, or have you heard um, of task analysis before? Okay, sometimes every once in a while I get an ABA person in my class. I just kind of want to get a baseline of what your guys' experience is. Okay, um, so let's go ahead and get started then. So we always want to review as you know, it relates to the Ohio Administrative Code, how that governs what we do and how that applies to skill building is that the activities that we're doing with our clients should be intended to achieve identified goals or objectives as is outlined in their treatment plan, which may involve developing and providing solution focused interventions and emotional and behavioral management drawn from evidence-based psychotherapeutic treatments. And that really kind of describes applied behavior analysis and specifically uh, task analysis that we're gonna learn about today. So this is uh, falling in accordance uh, with the Ohio Administrative Code as to what TBSs can do. Um, however, this is, oh, oh, I clicked on the link. Oh, geez, <laughs> let me click back. There we go. Um, so this is not going to certify you to be an ABA. We'll talk about that here in a minute. But even um, if you're not a, be a behind, a applied behavior an analysis, you can still um, use aspects of the concept and how you approach your clients and you can do um, a task analysis as well. Um, so what this looks like for you working with your clients is just further developing their daily living skills as is identified um, in their treatment plan as being in need. But remember, we don't just want to teach activities of daily living um, for the heck of it, there needs to be a mental health barrier or a mental health diagnosis that is showing that that is the reason why they cannot do this on their own, or that is the reason why um, TBS is necessary um, service to provide to this particular client. Um, so let's first just kind of talk in generalities as to why, you know, building skills, learning new skills um, is important for our clients. Um, our first why that we've identified is that it hopefully allows clients to have equal opportunities in life, thrive on their own terms and conditions, learn what is important to them. Um, but I do just wanna pause here for a second and see what you guys think. Learning skills, teaching skills, uh, building on skills with clients is important um, in the work that you guys have been doing. What have you guys seen? Um, it kind of goes back to, I guess, achieving independence, but also like boosting their self-esteem too, because when they learn something that they didn't learn before, even just as us too, like our self-esteem gets a lot higher. We feel more confident. We feel like we can, you know, take on other tasks. So I think that's very, very important. Absolutely. Improving uh, self-confidence, feeling good about ourselves. Absolutely. Um, okay. and Skill building also helps with like decreasing symptoms overall, because if you achieve something, usually that means you've progressed and gotten better and stuff like that. So, yeah, definitely like a building block. Like if somebody's stuck or if they're not feeling motivated, we can remind them of what they have accomplished. And maybe that motivates them to learn more or to do. Oh, look at that. Something different. Yeah. Oh, that's really cute. Oh. Um. Anybody else on why uh, skill building is important or what you have seen with your clients um, teaching them new skills or building on skills they already have? I think you touched on a couple good ones. Okay. All right. Well, let's kind of get into it. Um, just a reminder before you start doing any new intervention or any new activity, please read your client's assessment so you understand what their needs are. So we're teaching skills that are important to them. And as you're reading these assessments and these evaluations, look for opportunities where people can become more independent, overcome barriers. Um, we wanna honor their treatment preferences so if they prefer to receive information in a certain way. Can we accommodate that? And again, building on strengths and abilities that they already have and um, maybe applying those in different areas of their life. 
So let's talk specifically now about task analysis as an activity that you may do. And before we um, get into task analysis, though, I need to sort of educate you a little bit on that task analysis is uh, applied behavior analysis um, task, if you want to think about it that way. So um, just be careful to stay within your scope of practice. Remember um, that you are not becoming a behavior you know, analyst just by taking this one hour training. Today, we're just gonna learn the basics of ABA, very introductory. You're gonna learn the basics of a task analysis. Um, and I think a lot of it um, that is helpful is to sort of learn the theory behind it that you can apply in other areas. So you're gonna use this intervention of task analysis as you provide the service of TBS to teach your clients a new skill. A new skill. It's almost, almost like um, a new way to approach teaching or a new way to approach working with your clients by using ABA. Um, so you may have heard of it before. A lot of times it's linked to working with people who have autism, although the field really is much broader and can be used with other diagnosis besides autism. Um, let's just get some basics under our belt. Um, what is it? <laughs> the definition that we're going to be uh, basing this presentation off of um, is defined as the application of principles of behavior to socially significant issues to produce meaningful and measurable change. And I love that definition. We're going to break it down and talk about almost each one of those words um, individually, because I think that really explains what ABA is and sort of how to come from this uh, applied behavior analyst um, background or, or position. So the first part of that definition is uh, that we are applying principles of behavior to socially significant issues. So what that means is we should be teaching skills that are important to our client's life. So we um, are always assessing needs and part of our assessment of needs is learning what could they benefit from. Um, consider what would improve their life if they were doing more or less of it. So maybe they're already doing things um, to work towards their goal, but could they be doing more of it? Or if they did something less, but that also has a positive impact on their functioning. And then our job is to help them figure out how they can do more or how they can do less of a behavior that may be already helping them. So that's the socially significant portion of the definition. Um, so ABA is the application of principles of behavior to socially significant issues. The next part of it is to produce meaningful and measurable change. So we're going to learn here in a second that behavior is something we observe. But kind of going beyond that idea, can we measure, can we count, can we see what they're doing and then use that as a basis to gauge progress? So just as an example, if a client already is taking two 15 minute walks a week and finds that those walks help decrease their anxiety, um, it'd be not much of a stretch probably to help them take three minute or three 15 minute walks a week and then experience even more of a decrease in anxiety. So could they just do what they're already doing more? or longer to have um, even a more positive impact on their mental health or a more positive impact on their functioning. That's kind of sounds like a simple suggestion, but one that your client may not have thought of. Um, another example is if your client's drinking a six pack of beer three nights a week, and then they find that they're depressed the next morning, what if we didn't ask them to stop drinking at all, but maybe they just drank two six packs two nights a week? They'd be you know, feeling less depressed uh, for uh, that one that one night out of the week, could we help them to do that? And then our job is to brainstorm, how could you drink less? Uh, what would that look like? Um, how could I help you to do that? Um, that's kind of where TBS comes in, um, looking to provide meaningful and measurable changes in their client's life. And sometimes we don't have to ask them to make a big change. It could be just a small, a small change, taking one more walk, drinking one less night a week, for example. Um, so I love that definition. I think it is very um, easy to understand. And hopefully you can see where a TBS could absolutely apply some of those principles um, of ABA to have your clients notice improvements in their life. Um, and it's also very scientific. So ABA also um, uses scientific methods. It has a way for us to understand people in terms of their behavior and also take into consideration um, their environment and how that absolutely has an impact on their behavior. Um, just as an example, if you grew up 
you know, and your mother or your father or whoever your caregiver was, um, was ironing and they told you, you know, stay away from that hot iron, don't touch it. That's one thing. But if you actually touch that hot iron that's in your environment and you burn yourself, that's kind of a real quick way uh, to learn based on what's in your environment, what happens when I do that? Some people may um, have been exposed to things like that. Um, some people may have not. So we have to take into consideration what's in their environment now that's um, influencing their behavior. What maybe have they experienced in their environment in the past that has contributed to the person uh, that you see today? Okay. Um, so ABA, Applied Behavioral Analysis, is based on behavioral theory, which tries to explain uh, what people do, why they do it, by using what we see and what we hear. So it's very objective. Um, it is kind of a scientific way to look at what's going on with your client. Um, that is the basis of ABA's behavioral theory. Um, let's learn a little bit more about what AB, ABA is. Um, it kind of looks at a way to understand if we're not seeing change occurring in our client's life, you know, what could be the rationale or what could be going on behind the scenes that is maybe not leading um, to change. So we'll talk about some fundamental concepts um, as it relates to human behavior um, and their environment that we need to consider. But let's, I've already mentioned behavior a couple times. Let me go ahead and define it for you so that you know what we're talking about when I say the word behavior. Um, for the purposes of this training, uh, behavior is literally everything a living organism does. Like I already mentioned, it's observable and measurable. I can see it, I can count it. Um, sometimes though, people get a little confused and they try to describe um, internal states of being instead of behavior. So irritated and bored are not behaviors, but what a person does when they're irritated or what they do when they're bored um, are the behavior. So if a person picks up their skin and throws books across the room when they're irritated, the picking of the skin and the throwing are the behavior. If when somebody is bored, they eat a whole bag of potato chips, eating the whole bag of potato chips is the behavior. Being bored is their internal state that may uh, motivate them to eat that bag of chips. Um, so unless we're clear on what it is that we're trying to work with our client to increase or decrease in their behavior, it's hard to tell if our interventions are working. So that's why we want to stick to describing behavior and not internal states or um, just a state of being. We want to keep it very measurable, keep it observable, uh, make it something we can count. And we'll talk about specifics here um, in the next couple slides. So let's try a little activity. Um, has um, people in this class, have you guys used the annotate function? It's a little pen. You should see it at the bottom of your screen. It'll say annotate. You can click on it. And then you can either circle the behavior or there's also like a stamping function. Um, you could stamp next to what you think um, is a behavior, for example. Everybody seeing that little annotate? It's a little pen. Okay, go ahead and just circle or make a little stamp next to what you feel are um, our behaviors. If it's not, you can just go ahead and leave it. I don't see that. Would it only be if you're using the Zoom app? Because I have to use the browser because my camera doesn't work otherwise. Um, I'm not sure. That's a good question. I don't know. Is anybody else using the browser? I don't know, mine at the bottom, it's a little pen. It says annotate. This is a small class. So if you don't see it, we can just talk about it. That's okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. That's a good question. Okay, I'll give you guys another second or two. Circle the behavior. Remember behaviors are things we can count, things we can see, things we can measure. Okay. All right. Thanks, guys. So nobody chose hungry. We have a lot for throwing a ball. We have a couple for compliant. 
We have a bunch for driving a car. We have a bunch for eating cookies, a couple for inappropriate. Okay. All right. So let's talk about this. And if you chose something, um, you know, please feel free to give, give your rationale. Um, but really behaviors are um, things we can count. We can measure how long they occur. We can observe them occurring. We can count, you know, again, how many times those items have happened. Um, so terms like aggressive and compliant don't really describe what the person is doing. It's kind of an opinion of how they are performing a behavior. So like I could hand you this pen gently, and that's kind of also my opinion, or I could hand you this pen aggressively and throw it at your face. So kind of in that example, aggressive is describing how you perform a particular action and the measurable behavior would be handing over the pen. Um, kind of like I described earlier, hungry and depressed are internal states. So I don't really know that you're hungry or I don't really know that you're depressed until you tell me. Those are things that are going on internally with a person um, and are different, you know, from person to person. Um, terms like inappropriate are subjective. It's based on your opinion and can differ, again, depending on somebody's environment or situation. Um, for example, if you're being abducted and you start hitting somebody, that's going to save your life. But if you're at work and you start hitting somebody, you might, you know, lose your job. So it's different from situation to situation. You know, again, being loud at a rock concert is expected. Being loud at the library is not is not expected. Um, so what are actually behaviors up on the screen is throwing a ball, giving a high five, eating cookies. Uh, driving a car are the actual behaviors. The other ones kind of describe either how somebody did a behavior or is a more internal state. Um, Any questions or I want to elaborate maybe on why you chose something to be a behavior. Does that make sense? Okay, here in a minute, um, we're going to talk about why, you know, it's important to be specific when we're talking about um, behaviors and to make sure that we're not actually referring to internal states um, or opinions. Um, so like I already said, um, behavior, um, we wanna be specific in what it is that we're targeting with working on with the client. If we describe behaviors using vague descriptions, that could mean a variety of things. You know, My opinion of compliant is probably different than your opinion of compliant. Then we can't really be sure that the interventions we're using, the work that we're doing with the client um, is helping them to actually make a change or not if we're not clear on what the behavior is. Um, so be specific. Try to avoid goals like George will be more appropriate or Mary will be less aggressive. Um, they don't give us a good idea of what they actually should be doing or should be doing less of. You know, I've seen treatment plans that say, you know, Larry will display more positive behavior or Larry will be less negative. I'm not really sure what that is referring to. So the context, like I already alluded to, really does matter. The behavior of hitting is really neither good nor bad until you put it into a context. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, behavior itself really is neutral until we know the situation, until we know what the context is. And let me kind of further explain that hitting situation. Um, when people talk about a person's behavior, and they may even use quotations like that, oftentimes they're referring to actions that make those around them uncomfortable or that are disruptive. Uh, behavior that does not behavior does not have a value until we give it one. Um, like I said, behavior is neither good nor bad until it is observed in the context of the situation. Um, so the example you see there on the screen is, um, you know, it can be life saving to hit an infant on the back if they are choking. Obviously, that will dislodge whatever is in their throat, could save their life. However, if choking is not the situation that that little baby is in, um, you know, that would be considered abuse and could be very detrimental to, the, to that baby, um, could be injuring um, to that baby. So that's kind of what we mean by pointing it into the context of being good or bad until we know uh, what the situation is. So as you may be approaching your client or your um, treatment with your client from a behavior analysis position, just kind of remember behavior is neutral. I think this is a great way to also check our own biases or our own opinions that we, what we think is appropriate or what we think is 
um, disruptive and get real specific about what does that actually look like or how are we going to know if somebody is being um, appropriate. Um, so before we go um, too much further, let's talk about how do we increase the likelihood of um, target behaviors that we want to occur more often or how do we decrease um, the frequency of other target behaviors. Um, interventions in ABA all have the same basic goal of um, increasing or decreasing those specific target behaviors. For this to happen, target behaviors either need to be strengthened or weakened. Uh, reinforcement strengthens or increases the frequency of a behavior and punishment decreases the frequency. So let's get a couple examples and also learn more about the different types of reinforcement. There's both positive and negative reinforcement. They both increase um, the frequency of behaviors, but they do so in very different ways. And let's learn about that. Um, so as we go through the next couple slides, just to keep in mind, positive means that we're adding something to the situation or giving something to the person. Negative means we're subtracting or removing something from the person. Reinforcement, like I just said, tends to strengthen or increase behavior. Punishment, on the other hand, uh, weakens or decreases behavior. So that's a good way to remember that even though we talk about positive or negative, um, it has to do with either adding or subtracting from the situation. Um, so let's get some examples here. What the heck are we talking about? So here's a couple pictures. We see a little boy washing his hands. Whenever he washes his hands after dinner, he gives um, his caregiver gives him a cookie and the likelihood that he will wash his hands again in the future increases. So when a person does something and then is given an item that they like, this is considered positive reinforcement because it increases the chances they will do that hand washing again in order um, to get the cookie. So that's a great example of positive reinforcement. Another example of positive reinforcement for everybody in the room, um, if you exceed your productivity requirements, you get a bonus. So that is a great um, example of positive reinforcement. We're adding a desired circumstance or consequence after the completion of a target behavior. In this example, the cookie, or in your example, um, exceeding your productivity and getting a bonus. So kind of the opposite side of the coin is negative reinforcement, uh, where we remove an aversive circumstance from the situation, still to um, increase the likelihood that that behavior will continue or will increase um, in frequency. Um, just a heads up, this is a quiz question. Negative reinforcement and punishment are not the same. They're actually um, very different. We'll get to um, punishment here in a second. Let's just focus right now on negative reinforcement, removing an aversive circumstance. So an example might be a teacher um, will not assign homework if her students are able to complete all of their schoolwork during the day. So in this instance, uh, homework is the aversive circumstance that occurs uh, when classwork, classwork excuse me, is completed um, during class. Uh, so negative reinforcement of removing that homework hopefully increases the behavior of getting all your work done during the school day. Another example, this is a very good real world example, maybe more for us as adults. Um, Julie has a headache, so she takes two ibuprofen. An hour later, her headache is gone probably more likely to take ibuprofen again the next time she has the headache because it worked. Her headache went away and the removal of the pain is the negative reinforcement. But uh, keep in mind, whatever we are looking at as the reinforcer has to be important to the individual. Um, they must like what is intended as the reinforcer. So um, if for some reason that student, that one random student likes doing homework, they may not complete all of their homework during the school day so they can have homework at the end of the day. Or if for some strange reason, um, a child doesn't like cookies, maybe that's not the reinforcer to use to get them to wash their hands. You might wanna use something else um, besides cookies. So that's positive reinforcement, adding something, negative reinforcement, taking away um, an aversive circumstance. Um, I alluded to punishment. There are both positive and negative punishments. A punishment is when a change occurs after a behavior, which reduces the likelihood that that behavior will occur again in the future. So there are both positive and negative punishments. They both decrease behaviors, but again, they do so in different ways. Here's my example of positive punishment. If a football player is late to practice, 
Their coach makes them run laps in the hope that they will not be late to practice in the future. So we're adding what is thought to be an aversive circumstance after a uh, undesirable uh, behavior of being late to practice. Um, so that's an example of positive punishment, adding something to the situation to decrease the likelihood that it occurs again in the future. Negative punishment, on the other hand, is the other side of the coin, not allowing a high school student to attend prom if they have an F on their report card. So taking away something that is seen to be positive to that person or desirable um, when we have an undesirable um, behavior. So negative punishment decreases the target behavior by taking away something that is preferred or desired. However, just like with reinforcement, the punishment needs to matter to the person. If a football player doesn't care about running laps, they may still continue to be late. That may not be enough um, to encourage them to be on time to practice. Likewise, if that high school student didn't want to go to prom to begin with, that may or may not encourage them to get better grades in the future because they never wanted to go to prom um, anyway. So think about the punishment. Is it important to the client? Does it matter? Um, do they value it or not? So that is um, punishment, that is reinforcement. Both of them have positive and negative um, approaches to it. A little bit more background about what is AB, excuse me, what is ABA? Um, this all comes from like the original 1968 Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis. Um, and it finds that if the intervention that you're working on with your client doesn't contain all seven of these dimensions, it has the likelihood to not promote a change in behavior. So if you're coming from uh, applied behavior analysis approach, your intervention needs to be applied, behavioral, analytic, technological, conceptual, effective, and have the concept of generality. So we'll talk about each one of these. And I would encourage you, as I talk about these seven dimensions, think about interventions that you're already doing and are they meeting um, these seven criteria? It's very interesting. Um, so the first one is that the intervention needs to be applied. And what that means is it deals with a problem that is really important and really matters to your client. So if your client wants to make more friends, a way to be um, you know, applied in helping them to make friends would be using reinforcement to increase the number of times they greet their peers to support them in making friends at day programs. So you want to work on something that matters to your client that is going to make a positive impact on their life based on their needs. And they should really be doing this regularly, something they should be doing every day um, because it is, it is important to them. So look for it to be applied. Also um, needs to be um, showing that it is um, observed and measured and can be validated. So this is how you know that your client has achieved their objective and it's time for a new one. So this behavioral dimension of ABA is a lot of the reason why we're asking you to write objectives that are measurable, achievable, and time specific. We wanna know that your client has achieved this so we can move on um, to the next one. So we can, again, see how many times the behavior has occurred, how long it lasted. Um, you can count it, you can measure it. Um, so the analytic aspect of ABA means that the intervention can reasonably lead to a change in behavior once your client has mastered it. So this means that they can hypothetically do this behavior. It's within their um, capability to do it. This is also why we want our objectives to be achievable. This is kind of another way of saying that. Um, it's within their capability to do it. They could master it. Um, they could perform it. Um, technological means that the intervention is described well enough to be replicated by others and produce the same results. Um, so an example would be maybe there's a client at a day program who's working on increasing the frequency of hand washing. Maybe their um, TBS at day program has helped them come up with a hand washing protocol. It is used at day program. They also use it at work with their job coach. They use it at home at their residential program. And we're seeing that the client is increasing the frequency with which they're washing their hands across all settings because it has been written so specifically and so well that all of his staff in all those different settings can support that client um, to do that. So it needs detail, maybe pictures. It needs to be descriptive um, to help him or her achieve 
um, those results across settings. Um, ABA concepts um, need to be conceptual, it refers to the intervention being based on a specific theory. And in this case, ABA is based on behavioral theory. Um, ABA is a scientific, evidence-based and researched approach. So it meets the criteria for being conceptual. Uh, number six is that ABA, the uh, dimensions of ABA needs to be evident that this intervention is effective and it is producing important outcomes. It's improving the client's quality of life. Um, so we know it's working, so to speak, because we can measure it. For example, you know, how many times per week is the client washing their dishes compared to the first week that you began keeping track of this behavior? So we've been specific about the target behavior. We're trying to increase or decrease. We know that it's uh, working because they're doing it with more frequency and improving their quality of life. And then the last one is um, the interventions within ABA need to have the concept of generality, which means that they may do the same skill in different settings, even after treatment is over, they may continue, for example, because they learned how to brush their teeth at their residential program, when they go home to visit their parents, maybe still are brushing their teeth in that setting. May also uh, brush their teeth whenever they're at day program. Whatever setting they're in, they're able to apply that concept of generality in different settings, in different situations. Um, so now that you have a little bit of a background about ABA, let's learn specifically about task analysis, which is an ABA intervention. Um, this should be handout 3.1 um, that I emailed out to you earlier, I believe yesterday. Um, I'm just going to summarize this uh, 3.1 in the next couple of slides. So um, I encourage you to actually read the handout um, in more detail, but this is the essence of what task analysis is. Um, it's the process of breaking a skill down into smaller, more manageable components. So almost like bite-sized steps, if you want to think about it that way. Uh, because if you're just like, oh, you need to clean your room or you need to make dinner, there are so many micro steps involved in cleaning your room or making dinner that we assume the client knows or they assume um, or we assume that they know how to do it when they may actually not know how to do it. So task analysis helps us um, to be specific in what we're teaching, what we expect, what we're looking for um, when it comes to teaching those skills. Um, but once the task analysis is complete, it's used to then teach clients with autism spectrum disorder, um, IDD, developmental delays, cognitive delays, and just really other mental health diagnosis as well a skill that is too challenging to teach all at once. You know, if I tried to teach somebody to clean the house and do it well, you know, and to do, do a good job of cleaning the house, there are so many little steps that go into that. We wanna be specific about what we're talking about, even using pictures, using words or a combination thereof. Um, this is uh, page two of handout 3.2, what you see here on the screen. Um, showing step-by-step, step, what does it mean to vacuum? You know, what does that all involve? What is the expectation of that skill um, being complete? So staff will teach skills along the way one by one using those reinforcers that we talked about earlier. It doesn't have to be a cookie. You know, it could be um, you know, spending time with the client, playing a game with the client, use what is motivating uh, for your particular client. Um, but that is a great way to um, sort of shape behavior, mold behavior, and uh, teach the skill um, as you go. So let's look at that 3.1 handout. This is really um, how to do a task analysis. First, you wanna identify the target skill that you're teaching the client, which will consist of a series of distinct specific steps. So this is a very specific um, approach to teaching. We're being not only specific about the behavior that we're looking for, but all of the steps to accomplish it. And you want to make that perfect bite, so to speak. Um, too simple of a task might be turning on the sink faucet. Maybe your client's done that a bajillion times. They could do it in their sleep. They got it. Too complex, though, might be preparing, serving, and cleaning up dinner. That's way too much. That's too overwhelming. What might be just right is teaching how to wash the dishes. Maybe that's manageable. Maybe we can uh, write out the steps, use pictures to outline how to wash dishes and your client could feasibly um, complete that particular task. So be like Goldilocks, not too simple, not too complex, be just right. And that's gonna depend on your client. People are different. 
um, as far as how much information can they take in, how many words, how many pictures. Um, so tailor it to your client. Um, step two is to figure out what they already know. Identify previous skills and materials that they need in order to do the task. What do they already need to know before I start teaching? Um, so maybe you do want to teach how to wash the dishes. Before we even do that, do they understand things like, you know, not having the water be too hot, um, what to do and how to handle a knife? What would I do if a glass broke? You know, do they do they understand the safety that goes into it or are they good on that? And we could just pick up with washing dishes. Um, we, all, we often overlook the items that we need to teach. Do they have what they need to uh, wash the dishes? It's going to be hard to teach it if they don't have soap, a sponge, a dish rack, a dish towel, so on and so forth. Make sure they have what they need to be successful as far as previous skills and also the items handy um, to do that activity. Um, another thing to think about is building on what they already know. So maybe they are already good to go on washing cups, plates, and bowls, but they're struggling with those more difficult um, pots and pans with scrubbing them. So we could use what they already know, what they've already mastered by washing cups, plate, and bowls, and then kind of translate and apply that now um, to cleaning pots and pans. There's a lot of overlap, but there's also some additional skills required to really clean those um, pots and pans. So we wanna break the skill down into smaller steps so the learner can successfully demonstrate the skill by following those steps and do it yourself or even have somebody else follow those steps um, so that you can ensure that we haven't missed anything, make sure other people that may be supporting the client to wash dishes are also consistent using the same steps in the same order and allow the client also to practice um, each step of the task um, in session. So keep in mind and have maybe a little compassion or a little empathy for your client that this may be a little bit overwhelming, something they've never done before. Um, so keep that in mind, start small and use small steps along the way. Um, kind of like what this picture is showing you, how do you eat an elephant? If you don't eat it all in one bite, you're gonna eat an elephant one bite at a time. But we all take different size bites, you know, so to speak. Some people can, scarf down a sandwich in like three bites. Me on the other hand, you know, I take half an hour to eat a sandwich. So um, it's definitely individual. Think of what your client can handle uh, when you're breaking down those steps. So here's an example of what a task analysis might look like or sound like, again, being different for different people. So just as a place to start to set the table, the client's gonna put down the placemat. They're gonna place the large plate in the center of the placemat put the small plate in the upper left-hand side of the placemat, put a butter knife on the small plate, and then place the napkin to the left of the large plate. Um, for some clients, that may be just enough information. Others may really need it broken down further. Where do I get the placemats from? How many placemats do I put out? Where on the table do I position the placemat? So on and so forth. So everybody's task analysis will look different, even if, even if we're trying to teach uh, the same skill. Um, so step four is to confirm that the steps are represented accurately and completely. A great way to ensure this is to go through the steps yourself and then also have another person follow the steps word for word and see if you end up with the same result. Do we have a set table or are we missing things? Now, are we missing the fork? Are we missing... Um, the spoon, for example. Um, so we may be doing these things without even thinking about them, but remember that your clients um, may not be used to uh, some of these tasks. So it's easy to leave out steps. Having another person follow them really does confirm if it is accurate, we can revise it based on feedback that you obtain by having other people try the task. Uh, number five, want to think about learning styles. What is the client's goal? What is their experiences? Use your professional judgment and understanding of the client's needs when you're selecting the most appropriate strategy to teach. You want to honor your client's strengths, needs, abilities, and preferences. So again, it might be pictures. It might be words. You might be showing a video. They might watch somebody else set the table, for example. You may do hand over hand. Um, sort of um, taking their hand and setting the table in the way uh, that follows the task analysis or some kind of combination, role-playing, um, like I said, observing others. Maybe there's a song that we can come up with to help people remember the steps to setting the table. Be creative, meet your client's needs, 
um, we all learn in different ways and can benefit from different uh, approaches to that. So here's some other examples of real life um, task analysis that people have used with clients. This one is for grocery shopping that you see there. Um, it's all words, kind of a checklist of how to grocery shop and that works for that client. The other one on the right hand side of your screen is vacuuming and it's all pictures that may work um, for other clients. So yours that you're actually using with your clients may be more or less specific based on their needs. Could also be a video and also take it like a different format, like I said. Um, so really important to not only teach these skills and to be specific in the behavior that we're looking um, to achieve, but you know, please track progress. Um, you know, on this particular date, 315, this client was able to put plates on the table with verbal prompting. The next couple of days later, they just needed a gesture to put plates on the table. And then they were doing it independently on 321. So there's a little um, key down there for how much support did they need to complete those tasks. And then please, please, please encourage and praise your clients along the way, even as they make small um, steps uh, towards making progress. So this is handout um, 3.4 as an example of how to track progress. Um, handout 3.3 is a blank one that you could use uh, with your clients if you're tracking and monitoring progress. Um, so I've been talking for like 45 minutes. Let's stop here and just have a quick discussion. As I've been talking about things like washing dishes, setting the table, those might not work for your clients. Yours may be in a different situation, but what kind of skill might you use ta task analysis um, to teach your clients? You can just kind of start there. You can either unmute or go ahead and share um, in the chat. Um, I am reminded again of like technology in yeah. a time where I like showed my client how to like either get a new app or recover like an old app. Like they used to have Facebook and then they lost it. And like, we wrote down like simple steps, like, you know, like, like, you know, go to your homepage, open your app store, search FAC, Facebook, you know, mm -hmm. and then click on it. Maybe you have to enter your password and hit approve and then go back to your home screen, click on it, log in. So like, that was like, it ended up being like 10 steps, yeah. but it was like very well laid out for her so that like, you know, should she want to download a, a different app? Like, let's say she got interested in TikTok next week, then she knew how to do that. Okay. Um, That's great. That's a great example, actually. Um, So let's kind of take that and run with that. How would you use teaching somebody that skill and using a task analysis um, to work back on their mental health? diagnosis? How might that link back to symptoms of mental health? Either Courtney or somebody else. Um, well, if they have like a lot of depression, like if they're trying to like contact their family members, like through Facebook or something, and they don't know how to, you know, it could create a lot of anxiety and depression. So being able yeah. to download that app and being able to use the app um, might alleviate some of that anxiety and depression because then they would be able to like contact their family members. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, that's precisely what happened. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Oh, perfect. <laughs> perfect. Yeah, because I mean, how many times do we make a goal with a client like, oh, I want to increase my social support to decrease symptoms of anxiety? I'm like, oh, okay, and we come back three weeks later or you know a week later and ask them how it's going, not having asked questions like, can you use your phone? Do you have the phone numbers? Who are you calling? When is a good time to call? You know, do some people like to text or should I be calling or contact them on Facebook? So, um, you know, if you want to set people up for success, I think that's exactly what you guys are describing is not just saying, you know, they're going to increase um, social outreach or social support, but what comes before that? Can they use their phone? Um, do they have the numbers they need? Can they operate it? That's a great, that's a great example. Um, anybody else? Did you think of a skill maybe that we didn't touch on that you might use um, task analysis to teach your client? And then how would you link it to mental health? We do a lot of independent living skills, folks that uh, are moving into their first apartment. So anything cooking, laundry, grocery shopping, I mean, you name it. 
Yeah. Yeah, I just sat in on uh, Stacy's class. She teaches right before me, the hour before. And there were lots of examples for anything across the board that you could think of uh, to use task analysis for. Um, it's not just, you know, hygiene. It's not just um, cleaning your house. There's lots of technology you guys mentioned, lots of other um, applications to uh, to use this in. So great, great. Just might have to get a little creative about it. All right, so how do we document this? Um, just like every other week, um, be sure to select the intervention. So this week we're talking about skill building and then underneath skill building, what specific activity did you work on to accomplish skill building? Um, if you're using a coping skill, please fill in the name of the coping skill. So don't forget to fill that out completely. And then for the client response, um, some of you may have been getting feedback about your client response section. So just to review like what we're looking for in a client response, um, it should have client quotations. It should reference the client diagnosis. It should talk about, in this instance, you know, how is not knowing that skill a barrier or what's coming up for the client as they're learning that skill? Is it frustrating for them? Is it depressing that they can't do this um, without any um, support? Um, it should link to their goal and objective. All of those items that we're looking for show medical necessity. Um, so let me read you a more easily um, visible example. So um, as it pertains to task analysis and really also independence, like we talked about last week, our example is uh, Sally demonstrated taking out the garbage for this TBS and showed how she checks food for expiration dates. Sally stated, I feel proud to keep my kitchen clean by taking out the trash and throwing things away. When asked about the dirty dishes in the sink, Sally stated, sometimes I don't have the energy at the end of the day to do my dishes. I also don't know how to scrub those big pots and pans. I don't think I have the right brush or sponge for that. So I just let it sit in the sink, but she finds it makes her anxious to know that there is work to do. Um, so this is the best version. Again, we have client quotes, we have uh, mentioning of the diagnosis. We are showing how lack of skill is a barrier to being independent. Um, we've mentioned the client activity of taking out the garbage, checking for expiration dates. We've mentioned uh, washing dishes. Um, it also shows how the client could lead to a decrease in symptoms if they were to master this. So if they could do those big pots and pans, if they had the energy to, and if they knew how, they probably would feel less anxious. They just need us to kind of problem solve of how to do it. What do they need to do the dishes? And maybe a little problem solving around that energy piece. It sounds like there's some depression um, going on. So I want to reflect that in your plan. How are we gonna overcome those barriers of not having what she needs, not having the skills, and maybe not even having um, the energy to do it. So our example in response to the client response is Sally agreed to learn to wash pots and pans during future sessions to be scheduled in the morning when Sally notes she has the most energy. So again, set people up for success. If they're telling you they're tired at 3 p.m., maybe that's not the best time to meet with them. Could we come in the morning? Or do you need to work on sleep hygiene? Uh, TBS will coordinate with staff to support Sally to budget and purchase dish soap, scrubbing pads that can be used to wash pots and pans um, in future sessions. So it sounds like she doesn't quite have what she needs yet but there is at least some sort of plan in place to get them. And we're also gonna to try to overcome her tiredness by coming in the morning uh, when she has the most energy. Um, so any questions, comments, concerns on documenting um, in the progress note and what that looks like, what we're looking for to show medical necessity. I have a question that's yeah. kind of general. Um, sure. I've always used, because and I'm used to writing for like a year now, writing writer instead of TBS. But I've started to try to try to switch myself to TBS. And in the in the first series, like of TBSU, I think one like one of the feedbacks was like, if you use TBS, you have to put specialists behind it. Is that true, or can you just write like TBS showed client blah blah blah? Um, I think that's kind of a nitpicky. Kind of, yeah, see, that's kind of, what I was wondering. Kind of thing. I mean, Medicaid is not going to throw it back um, if you okay. write CBS. It is much more specific to say 
you know, TBS specialist, because that's actually your title. But you see, I write, I write there, wrote TBS mm -hmm. myself. So okay, um, I was just wondering because TBS yeah. is much easier to write. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um, however, we should be talking about ourselves less than uh -huh. we were before because we have the new note. Now, I did reference myself there. You know, this TBS. Um, but this is the client's response to what I asked her to do, or this is the client. Like I, when I asked her about the dirty dishes, I didn't reference myself at all. I just said, when I asked about the dirty dishes in the sink, Sally stated X, Y, Z. So for as much as possible, we want the client response to be just that all about the client and not so much about us. We may sneak in because, you know, we're there, <laughs> but not every sentence should be, you know, this writer, this TDS, it should, I would say 98% all be just what did Sally demonstrate? What did she state? What did she report? Um, all about the client. So that's a good question. Yeah, I've heard that before. <laughs> um, anybody else? Either about response or homework plan, what those would look like. Okay, we have a couple minutes. Um, anybody unsure how they might work on um, skill building with their clients. And if you even want to try um, some task analysis or even some ABA stuff, anybody unsure of what that might look like um, with some of your clients this week or how you might demonstrate that you worked on skill building um, in your progress note? Everybody's good? Okay. All right. Well, like I said, as always, if you think of anything, um, don't hesitate to email me or reach out. No problem answering your questions, you know, even in between sessions um, after class. I'll send everybody the quiz, the recording, the PowerPoint. Um, you should already have all those handouts. If you didn't get them, let me know. Um, otherwise, have a good week. Good luck doing some skill building. And I'll see you guys all back uh, next Tuesday. Bye. Have a good night. Uh, thanks. You too. Thanks, guys. Thanks. See ya.